Hello everyone. It would have been so much nicer if I could have been present in person to present this little talk to you. But then the situation being what it is, I'm forced to send you this electronic version instead. And so I would like to present to you some fluorescent sensors and logic systems for problem solving. And I'm very thankful to Janita Lienage, the SLAS president for thinking of me for this. And also to Ramani Vijayasekar, the international secretary for doing the organization. And I'm also thankful to Kaumal who's helped me with my technological weaknesses. In spite of all his help, I am sorry that I can only present to you an audio file to accompany the PowerPoint slides themselves. There's no video. So I apologize for all that. But in that context, I'd like to present this little talk for you. The fluorescent sensors and logic systems are made from a design which is called the PET design, which started off in Colombo, which I'm very proud to mention, and it was continued in Belfast, and it has grown into a major design tool for sensors and logic systems now. And it starts off, if I take the top half of the slide, you can see there's a picture of a green leaf, and green leaves, as you know, conduct photosynthesis, and photosynthesis starts with PET or photo induced electron transfer, which means a photon comes in, which you see in the violet arrow, and then an electron is transferred from one place to another, and that you see from the peacock blue colored curved arrow. And the important action in this slide is the electron transfer happens between a fluorophore, which is a fluorescent dye that comes from the field of photochemistry. And the electron starts off from a receptor. And where do receptors come from? From biology or biological chemistry or supramolecular chemistry in general. So by combining different fields of chemistry, that's how we got to this design. And when photo-induced electron transfer happens, excited states, which are formed when photons shine on them, their energy is used up to transfer this electron. And because of that, a fluorophore, which is supposed to be a fluorescent dye, cannot give light back out again because the energy was used up. And that's why it's called the off state. And the bottom half of the slide shows you the on state. Now, the gray box is shown in brighter yellow. And you can see now there is a yellow orange light signal coming out of the fluorophore and that is the fluorescence light that a human being would see and that's why it's called the on state and why is it the on state it's because the photo induced electron transfer doesn't happen anymore that's why i've shown a black cross against the peacock blue arrow and why is that happening it's because the receptor has received a target and the target is a metal ion and a metal ion is positive electrons are negative as we have known from school days and so the opposite charges will attract and so the electron cannot be transferred and therefore the fluorophore's energy is not used and that energy can be put out as light and we see it. So what we find overall there is a very small molecule gets together with an even smaller atomic metal ion and we suddenly feel that because the light signal from the molecule reaches us even though we are much bigger than those atoms and molecules. Uh, and for those of you who like a bit more information, I put two references there on the left hand side of the slide in black. This is just a visual illustration of how PET sensors actually perform. The bottom row of beakers in this picture are four different PET sensors or switches, separate ones. And then the top row is the corresponding bottom row once they have received a target. And as you can see from the very bottom left, it's as black as night and the top one is shining out in blue. And the next one is again black to start with. When the target arrives, it gives out green light. And the next one does red light. And so all three of these are an illustration of the fact that this fluorescent PET design is very flexible. You can use different colored dyes as long as it fits the criteria we discussed just a moment ago. They will go from off to on when the target comes in. And then similarly, I'm showing you an example, which is the fourth column 
on the very right of the slide. You can even plan for the photo-induced electron transfer to not take place at the start and then for it to only kick into action when the target is received. And that's that case there in the, on the very right hand side. Starts off as a sky blue light signal and then when you add the target, then it goes to black as night there, on to off. Oh, I must also say in all of these slides, what you have from the very start is that uh, you will have uh, ultraviolet light source falling on all the beakers and that's the power supply. As you might expect from a simple design, as I've illustrated to you before, starting out with school ideas, there has been a very huge uptake of this method by labs around the world. I'm showing you just one world map here for our time and memory limitations, but there is over 900 labs participating that I've been able to find, which probably means there is a lot more now. And it's an illustration again, how a little bit of science which started off in Colombo, in Colombo, and a long time ago also, 40 years ago, is now used around the world. Here's the best example of a problem solving with fluorescent sensors and logic systems that I have to offer you. I was really privileged to participate in this because uh, as scientists, we publish our work and then that's it. But then I was very fortunate that Roche Diagnostics, the giant multinational, some of their scientists read some of these papers that we had put out from Queen's University of Belfast at the time. And then they collaborated and then we were able to produce this. And so as you see here from the title in red, these are off to on sensors for sodium ions. And the picture on the right half of the slide divided into a green box and a red box and then a yellow box down below are what we discussed earlier for the fluorescent PET sensors in terms of the boxes. So there's a receptor, there's a spacer and there's a fluorophore and you can see the actual molecular structures involved. And this green receptor, for example, was well known beforehand to catch sodium ions in water and because of that it was very suitable to use in this sensor. And so the team of people shown in blue there, they are all from Roche. And then as a result of this, they launched a separate company. It's called OptiMedical. And you can put OptiMedical.com into your browser on your phone or on your computer. And you can see how these products are being used today, now. And I'm really happy to share this with you. So OptiMedical.com and then look for Opti products. And they will have these and they have some uh, COVID-19 tests now. But Opti products is what we joined them to do. And similarly, if you like to go to idex.com, uh, which is the next series down below the three company logos there, and but that site is a bigger site, but then you have to look for Vetstat products inside. They are a veterinary products company and they also are hugely involved now. They own Opti Medical now. And all this happened from those little sensors that we started to think about in the University of Colombo. So here is the actual product itself that Roche put out. As you see, it's a piece of plastic, transparent plastic, and then it's got a red stopper on the very far right. And by pulling that out, you can admit freshly drawn blood, whole untreated blood, huh? directly into this. And then there's this little loop that you can see, and that's the loop along which the blood will travel. And as it goes along there, there are six stations in total, but the five black stations are all fluorescent PET sensors. And these are micron filters in each one of these stations, and then the blood cells are filtered out, and then the plasma itself then contacts the fluorescent sensors, which are on the filter paper itself. And then we shine blue LEDs onto those filter papers, and then light comes from it. The fluorescent light will emerge from it, and it's about a yellow-green color. And that light intensity is measured, and that light intensity is 
proportional to the concentration of the sodium or the potassium and so on. And all of them can be calibrated absolutely so that then you can immediately get a number for the actual concentration of sodium in that patient's blood. And as you can see from that slide in the black writing on the very far right hand side of the slide, it has made a substantial amount of money. As you see, the total there is 550 million US dollars at least. And this is the figure I had a couple of years ago. So this has made much more, even in terms of money, if you like to think of it that way. But what I'm really proud about is that the actual life-saving elements that have been involved because these are used in ambulances, they are used in hospitals in general, and they were used by the ambulance crews in Sri Lanka during the civil war that we had a while ago. And so you can see these things are directly life-saving applications. And I would again encourage you to go to the optimedical.com and the idex.com sites where you can see a little more about what these things achieved. Remember again, here is problem solving by these fluorescent and pet sensors. And I should also mention what you have in the bottom half of the slide is what that little chip that we helped to develop goes into. It goes into a little box. It's about the size of a laptop computer that most of you will carry now. And the chip is put inside and there just for illustration you can see a hypodermic needle and syringe they're sticking out of the box. And so you can imagine where the plastic chip goes. It's underneath that lid there. But again don't forget here is genuine problem solving which is practiced around the world and it's over a half a billion US dollars in industry. And where did it start? University of Colombo. We were able to take the ideas of fluorescent sensors that we talked about a moment ago and convert them into molecular logic, which is an entirely new field. And I'm delighted to mention here Nimal Gunratna and Colin McCoy. Uh, Nimal is from the University of Colombo and Colin McCoy is from Queen's University where Animal and I work now. And so it was a real pleasure this about 30 years ago now that we were able to start out this field of molecular logic. But I'm also trying to mention there George Bull. He's the man who was responsible for the ideas which put a mobile phone in your pocket and who put a computer on your desk. And so these are very large ideas and these ideas started out in the island of Ireland also. So we feel very privileged to have been here in Queen's University of Belfast to develop this. But the idea again started from the University of Colombo. The seeds of molecular logic for me were planted by Satish Namasivayam, who did physics at the same time that I was doing chemistry. And then he's in the University of Morotu now. And he introduced me to logic gates practically. And so I'm very grateful to him for this as well. And so then molecular logic as a subject now, it's a part of chemistry or part of supramolecular chemistry now. It can do lots of different things and maybe I'll show you a couple of them now, like human level computing, for example. So I put a lot of these ideas into a book, which I wrote now, uh, seven years ago now, uh, called Molecular Logic Based Computation. And there is a Chinese and a Japanese translation as well now. And so it's again a field which has been growing very greatly indeed. I'm trying to illustrate here the diversity that's available in molecular logic. And those are the sky blue boxes at the top and the bottom of the slide here. It is to show how when we do a reaction in chemistry or something that happens in the kitchen, you take a substrate which is shown in the orange box and you treat it with a reagent or a condition which is shown in black letters with the black arrows and then you will get a chemical reaction and that will be the product that is found in red. And then you will notice the product by reading it out in some way. And in all of these cases, we have various ways of performing those actions. So for example, you can choose a, for a reagent, you can choose an atomic or a molecular ion. And for the substrate, you can choose a small supermolecule. 
and to read out the target, you can use a fluorescent intensity. And that is what we started this field with, that particular set. But there are lots of other options there. And these are all options that have happened in the literature, not from the imagination. And then I'm also showing you on towards the top right hand of the slide there, another orange box, a logic device from your phone or from your computer to show you that the philosophy behind the logic device in your phone is the same as the philosophy when we do something in the kitchen or in a laboratory. You have inputs coming in and you have an output going out. That's it. And this connection was maybe our biggest breakthrough in terms of an idea. As you might guess, this general idea of molecular logic has had a huge uptake for sure. In fact, we have been able to find more than 1100 laboratories around the world and not only chemistry labs, there are molecular biology labs which are using this heavily now for synthetic biology, artificial life in general. And there are geneticists here. There are computer scientists who are running wet labs in computer science departments. So there again is something that started out as an idea in the University of Colombo, which is going to many, many places. And again, this world map is just one out of several, which I'm just showing you here as an illustration. Here is molecular logic being applied to problem solving. And in this case, the problem being solved is identification of a small object in a population. So for example, if you have a lot of cars, how do you, do, how do you identify a given car? It's by looking at its number plate. As an example, if there are a lot of people, how do you identify a person? It's by looking at their face or by checking their passport, for instance. So in general, here the problem concerns small objects of sub-millimeter kind of size. So they'll be the size of living cells, even though I'm not a biologist at all, so we won't be testing living systems. But nevertheless, the ideas will be applicable there. And so Chao Yi and Jue and Lin Yihong helped me in this work, which is was published last year, but it depends on something that we published 13 years before that. There is currently a really successful way of identifying objects in populations, and it's called radio frequency identification, shown in red there at the very top of the slide. And this came out of semiconductor computing technology, and it's used very widely, and it's used for goods especially, but it can also be used on people quite dangerously by embedding a small chip. It's done for animals quite commonly uh, in order that you can track the animal where it goes. And so this technology is already available, and it's a hugely problem-solving technology. Uh, I've shown you an example there towards the bottom of the slide, the uh, uh, RFID chip from Hitachi, which is quite old slide really. It's one millimeter square and so it's smaller than a grain of rice as shown there. The white particles are rice grains there. And so what we can see is that these are pretty small as they are, but it's very difficult to make them much smaller. Currently the smallest ones are about 0 0.1 millimeter square. And there is a real difficulty, a theoretical difficulty, to go much smaller because they have to use an antenna. And the antenna cannot be made much smaller because it depends on the frequencies that are used for the wireless signals to go. So here is a very successful technology which is limited by size. But the moment you take molecular versions, then that size problem disappears because molecules are so much smaller than one millimeter. In this slide, I'm showing you a series of red plastic beads. They look red because they're emitting red fluorescence light. And what I'm showing you is uh, in every vertical column, uh, little plastic beads 
tagged with different molecular logic gates. As you know, logic gates come in various types and they have various names. For example, like the yes logic gate, off to on signals, which I showed you earlier. Or similarly, a not logic gate would have been the on to off signal I showed you before. But there are others called the pass one logic gate, which is where the signal remains switched on all the time. So what we have done here is to put molecular logic gates of the pass one type and of the yes type and then made combinations of those. So by taking a one to one mixture of the two, you will get the middle column, the yes plus pass one. And by mixing them in other ratios, you can do a yes plus two pass one and so on. And then by measuring the fluorescence of the beads under a microscope, and then in base and acid, like we would do in a titration in school, you can measure the fluorescence enhancement factors, Fe values, when you add protons. So in other words, what is the intensity of the plastic bead in base and what is the intensity in acid, acid to base ratio. And those are the numbers you see written there in blue on the slides. And at the very bottom of the slide, I'm showing you the averages. As you would expect, a pass one logic gate, which is just a fluorescent dye with no pH sensitivity at all, it should give a fluorescent enhancement factor of one because there should be no change. And then if you have a yes logic gate, you should get a very large number depending on how much is the difference between the off signal and the on signal. In this present case, our difference is not so large and the factor is only 2.2. But as you can see, 2.2 is very different, out, well outside experimental error from 1.5, from 1.3, from 1.2 and 1.0. In other words, from these fluorescence enhancement factors, we can say which logic type is tagged onto the bead. What I'm showing you here is a histogram of the fluorescence enhancement factors, these Fe values on the x-axis, and then the frequency of their occurrence. How many times do you see a particular fluorescence enhancement in a bead population? So this histogram is made from the pictures you saw on the previous slide from the fluorescence micrographs there. And now, for those of you who are interested, I'm also showing you the molecular structures involved. As you can see, these are similar to what you would see in a porphyrin, in, in a green plant, for example. These are like half porphyrins, and then they are having a receptor, which is a NET2 group on the side. And if you want to see it with me on the purple labeled case, the yes logic gate, you can see at the very top of the molecular structure in black, a NE2 group, and that is a amine. And the amine or amine will respond to protons, as we know, amines are basic. And then the pass one is shown in sky blue right next door to the left hand side there. And there you only have the half power in itself. So it is a fluorescent dye alone. And in the purple or violet case, you are seeing a receptor and a spacer which is a CH2 group, and then the fluorescent dye itself. And then what you see in this histogram is the different families of logic tagged molecules form into different groups. The blue ones are separate from the red, and the red ones are separate from the yellow, and then you have the green, and then you finally have the violet. And they're all separate, except I'm sure some of you spotted it. Out of our green family, one of them is an outlier, and it comes really close to the yellow, but it's still, you, you might have mistaken it for the yellow, but it's not within the yellow population. So we were lucky with that. But um, we are sure that if we were in a more technologically powerful lab, then that kind of outlier can be avoided. But basically this slide is to show that you each logic tag can be identified separately in the populations. Here is another example of molecular logic, and this is an example of human scale molecular logic. And so we are very happy to present you with this example, because this is a kind of molecular computation 
which is happening in you right now just now you can't avoid this even if you tried if your eyes are open you are doing this function let, let me explain quickly uh, this starts off in psychology really and i was lucky to find out um, that when our eyes are observing the world around it one of the most important things it has to do is to evaluate the threat or the danger of the objects that are coming close to you so the eye will look at things coming close to you and then it will quickly take a picture and then it will draw the outline of that picture and all of this is done by the eye not by the brain it is done in your retina itself so your retina in the back of your eye is computing besides being a camera and then it sends the outline image to the shallow part of the brain and asks have you seen this image before and then if the brain looks at its database itself and looks for the dangerous things it has seen recently so for example if it's an elephant then oh elephants are fine they're not dangerous but if they come at you then they will be dangerous so it looks for an image which has really big ears and a really long nose and so if a person is approaching you you won't have that situation of very large ears and a very long nose and so the brain immediately tells to the eye it's fine that is not an elephant that is just your boyfriend girlfriend husband wife it's okay and then you can relax otherwise it'll activate your feet and it'll get you to run away from that and all of this happens within a millisecond of time or so. At least that's what the psychologists seem to say. But there is your security system. There is your bodyguard, which is really molecular at the back of your eye. So that's a massive human level computation, which protects you every single day. And edge detection can be done with molecules as well. As I said, uh, it's the psychologists who discovered these first. And then the, I put two cases at the bottom right corner of the slide there, which inspired me. The first case there from the journal cell was a case where the bacteria can perform edge detection. And the next reference in nature chemistry is where DNA networks can perform the computation. But DNA networks have some relationship to life, I would content so we can take completely synthetic molecules and jue and gawa and jessica and tom helped me with this and that we put out in 2015 as an example where synthetic molecules made in a lab like yours or mine in a chemistry lab can be made to perform edge detections here is the result of molecular scale edge detection what we have here in this picture right at the very top left corner is a mask with a square hole in it just a piece of black plastic and we have cut a square hole and that will be our object and then we are going to image this object onto a filter paper and you see eight filter paper images there and each one of these filter papers is treated with a solution which we make up which i will discuss in a little moment but in this filter paper then we treat this filter paper and then of course it's dried carefully at 50 degrees celsius for four minutes this is quite important and then we cover it with this mask and after covering it with the mask we shine 254 nanometer light which is available in the ultraviolet lamps which are present in many chemistry labs for looking at TLC plates, for example, thin layer chromatography. In other words, it's a very common piece of equipment in chemistry or biochemistry labs. And then when we cover that mask and shine the 254 nanometer light for a certain period of time, after that we switch off the light and then we remove the mask and we take a picture of the filter paper by shining 366 nanometer light written there in pink and then you get a fluorescence image and that also comes from the uv lights that are available in the labs which usually have two lamps inside one is 254 nanometer and the other one is 366 short wave and long wave light it's called so it's a fairly cheap piece of equipment and so we do this again and again first of all with zero time uh, zero minutes and then 0 0.5 minutes one minute two like that up to half an hour and then you see what happens 
in the filter paper, you start to see the image of our object. The object is a square. And you see at eight minutes, for example, you can clearly see a orange square, orange gray square, which is the positive image of the object. But then if you keep doing the experiment for longer periods of time, you can see by the time you get to 32 minutes, see what you get. Most of the square is back to blue again. And you're left with just a thin border. And that border is that orange gray border. And this is the visualized edge. So you had the square, say a white square, uh, and bordered initially by a whole lot of black. And now you see the thin border shown up. This is the detected and visualized edge. And of course, it's done by using a PET sensor, which I'm showing you there at the very bottom right in the white panel. And you can see a blue fluorophore, a red spacer, and a nitrogen amine receptor for a proton. And in this example, we are combining this fluorescent PET sensor with a photoacid generator. Photoacid generators take light in and put out protons. And these are manufactured, for example, by IBM. And that is how they cut the chips on your phone or in your computer. So they are very commonly available materials. And we combine the photoacid generator with our proton detecting pH sensor, the PET sensor, and that enabled us to create a molecular edge detector. Molecular edge detection, as we saw, is something that happens in your eye subconsciously. You have no role to play in it. Your body will do that in order to look after you. It will behave like your mummy. And that's function it will do whether you want it to do it or not. Here is an example of a molecular logical computation where it is performing a conscious task that all of us have done. And that is outline drawing. In this case, the science is exactly the same, but we are using it with a slightly different twist. Here is an example which was done by Jue and Gawa and Jessica again, along with David Fox there. And we again published it about five years ago. So this is an example of outline drawing. What is outline drawing? Sketching. Like there is a very famous outline drawing on the bottom right hand. This is Leonardo da Vinci's Universal Man who has forgotten his trousers, as you notice. And so in this particular example, it is outline. And in the outline, he conveys a message. And so we've all done this as children. And here is the molecules being made to do that. And we are going to do it for two cases in the bottom of the slide there on the left. We are trying to take a shamrock, which is the Irish national emblem, and then a bird and just showing you that we can get quite detailed resolution in the detected edge. And I'm showing you four examples done with four different molecular systems. And as you see, you can see the detected edge quite nicely. The very top of the slide shows you how this outline drawing is done in terms of philosophy. You take your template, whatever you uh, want to draw, like an artist will look at the target in front of them, and then you take an initial image, which is a positive, which is the second picture in green there, counting from the left. And then you expand the initial image. You make it get a little bit bigger, and that's what's called the subsequent image. And then you erase the original image. So everything within the dashed circle, you erase. And then you're left with the final image. And that is the visualized image. So that is the visualized edge as well. So here is molecules performing a function that you did as a child. This slide shows you a child doing this function. Uh, this is the daughter of a good friend of mine, and we got permission from the parents in order for her to pose for this picture. But what we wanted to illustrate from this picture is that when a child draws a picture, which is the shamrock, which is on the screen there in the top left of the slide, and Ella here has stopped drawing the picture halfway, she draws it in a very efficient manner. She just looks at the picture and then starts to draw back.
On the other hand, we've seen how the molecules do it. The molecules take a picture, they expand the picture, and they rub off what is in the center. So it's not very efficient, and you see it in green and blue there on the left hand of the slide. And I have also superimposed the two pH sensing molecules there on top of it, the molecular structures. And then in the middle on that little desk is an old laptop which is running an edge detection program the same one that will exist in your phone if you're changing the background before a Zoom interview, for example. So edge detection is very common in computer science and in technology in general. And so because of that, here is, uh, again, we are running the program halfway and crashed the computer at that point. So you can see what a halfway image is like. And you can see, does it row by row? raster scanning the picture and then picking up the edge as it goes from the place where the light intensity changes sharply from black to white or white to black and those are the points which are highlighted in the black spots which are joined together and you start to get the shamrock appearing there. So here is again an example of molecules performing a very human level operation. I've shown you how it can direct perform problem-solving operations which are involved in life-saving functions around the world and I've shown you other cases where they can perform the same actions the molecules can perform the same actions that humans perform so there is the great potential for problem solving in the future if there is the commercial and financial will like Roche showed us at the time so I'll stop there because my time is nearly up and thanks to all of you who are watching this online and again thanks very much for the chance to participate even from a distance thank you all very much